When we're looking at sex-linked um, recessive traits, there are going to be some patterns that will emerge with most of these pedigrees. Um, on your homework assignment, you had this example of hemophilia, which is a concept that we have looked at and investigated earlier in the class. Hemophilia will be one of those concepts that we'll come back to several times over the course of the year. So it is a recessive sex-linked disorder, um, which is, means that it's located on the X chromosomes, and a person's body cannot effectively control clotting or coagulation. And so even the simplest of paper cuts for some people with hemophilia can actually be a life-threatening situation for them. What I wanna do right now is to walk you through filling out these genotypes, um, and I'm actually gonna fill them out, not on the line, but I'm gonna fill them out in the circles. Something for you to remember is that if it is a recessive disorder, the individuals that have the disorder, um, if they are female, are going to be carrying two copies of that recessive allele. And if they're male, they only need one copy of the allele in order to actually be affected. So as I'm looking at this pedigree, all of the shaded versions on here, all of the shaded individuals, those are going to be the individuals that are recessive for the disorder. So starting off with this mother at the top in this first generation, she is going to be X lowercase h, X lowercase h. She needs to have two copies of that uh, basically dysfunctional or mutated allele in order for her to have the trait. And if we wanna go ahead and fill out all of the females then, we know that all of the females are going to have the exact same genotype that have the actual disorder. So I'm just gonna go ahead and paste those in. To be honest, this is what I normally do when I am working through filling out these pedigrees. I normally start with the things that are shaded, <clears throat> if it's recessive, and then if it is a dominant trait, which we'll look at in our next example, then I look at the unshaded versions first. Okay, so males are even easier. If the male has the trait, it means that their X chromosome has the affected allele, and then they always have Y. Again, they're getting that inheritance pattern from their mother. The Y is always coming from dad, and then the uh, allele for whether or not they have the disorder is coming directly from mom. Okay, so again, I'm gonna just start off by adding that to all of the males that are affected with the disorder. And it's actually the easiest way to do this pedigree. What I like about it too is it gives you a little bit of confidence because right away you're like, oh, look at that. I have about half of them filled out already. The next one that I like to do is uh, to look at is the male um, who is not affected because again, we can automatically know what their genotype is. So this dad did not have the allele for um, hemophilia, and so we know that he is X capital H Y. And again, I can go through and just fill that out for all of the other males that look the exact same, right? The males that are not shaded. And so now I just have to do a little bit of problem solving as to what the genotypes would be for the females that are remaining in this Punnett square. So if we look at individual number four, Individual number four does not have the disorder. And she would have gotten, and I'm gonna just do this really quick to show you, she would have gotten a copy, let's try that again, a copy of the normal allele from dad, and she would have had to have gotten a copy of the defective allele from mom. Okay, the same exact thing would have happened with her sister. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it in right here. And then I'll go back here and just really quickly fix out dad, who was normal, and mom who was carrying two copies of the recessive allele. So that gets us down to just two additional individuals. Now, when we are looking at individuals three and four and their offspring, so we're determining the alleles for 10 and 12, it's okay um, for you guys to go ahead and make Punnett squares on these. So I'm gonna actually just do that quickly off to the side here. So I'm gonna make a Punnett square to reflect what all the potential outcomes would be for this cross. So the mother is going to be listed on the top and the father listed on the side. Again, you don't have to do it that way. It's just something that I have done throughout 
um, our time together. And then I'm going to fill out that Punnett square the way that we have filled out so many Punnett squares before. Again, this is showing the what could potentially happen. It's not necessarily giving you the what will happen, right? So in this, it's showing us that we could have a son that would have the disorder for looking right here. This is showing us a son that has the disorder and actually that is shown in individual number nine. Um, and this one down here is showing us an individual that does not have the disorder and that's actually showing up in individual 11. Now, please remember that all of the boys could have been born with the disorder or all of the boys could have been born without the disorder. This is just what ended up happening with these particular individuals. Now, looking at the girls, the girls have two potential um, genotypes. They could be born homozygous, so they have two copies of the normal allele, or they could be carriers for hemophilia. Both of them will look normal. Both of them will look the same. There is no way for us to determine for individual 10 and 12 whether or not they were homozygous dominant or if they were a heterozygote for this. And because of that, we have to write down both X capital H, X capital H, and X capital H, X lowercase h, just because there's no way for us to know um, based on their phenotype, which is that they are normal, um, which version they actually are. And so I'm going to paste that in for both daughters. Now, how could we narrow that down? In the future, if individual 10 and 12 were to have offspring, we might be able to determine based on what their offspring are, what those individuals' genotypes were, right? We could narrow it down, but that's not what we're doing here. So, I mean, we're not given that information. All right, hopefully that helps you a little bit. Again, what I like to do in these is A, determine what kind of inheritance pattern I'm working with. In this case, it was recessive. So the shaded parts were showing recessive genotypes. In this, a recessive genotype for a female, you have to have two copies. So it's easy to go through and fill out that. The next part is filling out the males, which again is pretty straightforward. They only need one copy. Once you have that done, go back and fill out the genotypes for the males who are not affected. Again, they only need one copy of the normal trait. And then go through and do the problem solving for the females who are not affected by this trait. 